from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. This afternoon, my guest is the celebrated novelist and poet Ha Jin. Thank you so much for coming today. Oh, thank you. I'm very happy to be here again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. The life of this remarkable writer began in China, where his father was a military officer. At 13, Ha Jin himself joined the People's Liberation Army, which he stayed with until he was 19. He earned a master's degree in literature in China and earned a scholarship to Brandeis University in the late 1980s. When he and the rest of the world watched the Chinese government murder democracy demonstrators in Tiananmen Square in 1989, he decided to remain in the United States. He eventually earned a PhD, and now he teaches at Boston University. Over the years, he's published several unforgettable novels about life in China and the immigrant experience in America. He's won a number of awards, including two Penn Faulkner Awards, uh, including for one uh, called uh, War Trash, which is also a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. His new novel is called The Boat Rocker. It's a story of a Chinese expatriate named Fen Danlin. Yes. Okay. <laughs> who works in New York as a reporter for a news service that appeals primarily to Chinese people living abroad. And Danlin is so passionate about exposing what he calls the towering corruption of Chinese politics with his acid tongue and his heart-stabbing commentary. His personal credo is, honesty is strength. Mm -hmm. Democracy dies in darkness. <laughs> now, you, you must have started the boat rocker several years ago. Many years ago. And yet, it's being published at a time at a climate of ferocious attacks on the press. Uh, how is that possible? I don't know. Maybe something, you know, really is beyond myself. Always there's some, there's some coincidence. There's, same thing happened with war trash, uh, the uh, abuse of prisoners. Uh, the, um, but when I started the book, the, there was no such thing in my, on my horizon. And, but this book, in fact, I started, I started on the, uh, in 2007. What inspired you to write a story about a Chinese journalist in America who's so excited about freedom of expression? In fact, in 2003, there was a, a, a friend of mine who was a freelancer, uh, freelancing journalist. He wrote a series of exposés about a novel oh. uh, of a similar kind, not exactly the same, by, by, by a Canadian immigrant author. Yes. And, but because this, my friend's political position, he was very radical. Radical so he, in what sense? Uh, he supported the Taiwan's independence okay. and Tibetan's <laughs> All right. independence. Yes. So he was viewed as a kind of a, 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 an enemy, more than a distant an enemy of China. Of the Chinese state. Though. Yes, so as a result, his exposés didn't get anywhere. He was completely suppressed, didn't get anywhere. But what about in America? Huh? Even in America, didn't get <laughs> anywhere. Very briefly, people got, you know, it was published online, but didn't get anywhere. I know the feeling. Uh, <laughs> so I was amazed. I was really amazed by you know, the, the power that he could manage it, suppress the, the voice like that. Yes. <laughs> President Trump has called American journalists really dishonest people, bad people, <laughs> sick people, people who don't like America, and he's mused about how much he'd like to arrest and jail journalists. How does that <laughs> kind of language strike you? How does In it make you feel way, as someone who's... Sure, sure, but I think, again, that is against the Constitution, right? <laughs> and uh, I think apparently that was really, uh, that was not American. I think that kind of stem is not American, really. Uh, it's more like something from uh, the Chinese government. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Danlin, this journalist who's the center of your novel, uh, thinks that rocking the boat is not just right, it's a sacred duty. Yes. Do you feel that way? For me, it's not just duty, it's the way uh, how I exist, I think. That is very important. All I have is a voice. As long as I continue to write, I have a voice of my own. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Are you, do your, does your work get any attention in China? Are you allowed to travel there and speak there? I couldn't, uh, you know, I've been in the States for 32 years. I couldn't go back. 
and even my parents died. When they were dying, I still I couldn't go back to see them. And so I really, personally, I cannot go back to China or have anything to do in China. But about a third of my books got published in China. Really? But, but many of them are really censored. And for instance, I have a book of selected poems that just came out, but all the poems have uh, political resonance were pulled. Oh. So I felt all the teeth were pulled yes. <laughs> from that book. <laughs> and this book, has it been published in China? No, no, it's impossible. This is impossible, you Impossible, said. impossible. Only a third of my books. Oh. For instance, for a short story collection like The Bridegroom, they published it. But when it came to me, I saw two stories missing. Oh, two yeah. stories missing. So yeah. they basi basically, so, you know, they were somehow, they were incomplete. Yes, yes. Well, well Dallin's passion for American journalism sometimes sounds kind of naive. Yes. Uh, he tells one critic, in this great country, America, people go by the rules and reporters always publish the truth. <laughs> and I know a lot of journalists. <laughs> I am a journalist and I think that is generally true. And yet when he says it like that, I, it kind of makes me cringe. Uh, is he being set up? Are you setting him up as some kind of a zealot? Is this a parody of? You know, he's a troubled man. So psychologically, he's, you know, he has a lot of problems too, a lot of problems. He, the moment he arrived, he, his wife gave him divorce papers. And then his, his uh, past Chinese passport was uh, confiscated. Yes. And he, basically he was forced into exile. So he was troubled. So there was kind of a kind of entangled, complicated feelings between him and China. Yes. So he's trying to find this kind of different value system to su sustain himself. Right. So he, that's why he had to believe in democracy and freedom. And of course, eventually, he knows. <laughs> knows what? <laughs> knows, you know, it doesn't always work out that way. If, for instance, American uh, office, uh, you know, official will appear basically uh, the, uh, in response to Chinese government's request, and basically they also cooperate with the Chinese government yes. indirectly. Yes. Your point, your theme of the book is that American freedom of expression is more complex, more compromised than we let on? I think so. But, I, but yes, there are, there's all, there are always some kind of a, the city side. Um, I think uh, on the one hand, American, you know, I like the American idealism. You know, we are supposed to be the city, shining city on the hill. That's great. Yes. The vision, the beacon of freedom and democracy. On the other hand, uh, American pragmatism. That's also part of the American character. Uh, we calculate everything by dollars. Uh, and yes. <laughs> Danlin has to learn that having free expression and having the money to express oneself are two different things. Two different things, yes. Eventually yes. he learned that because even the agency was bought, acquired yes. by the Chinese government. Yeah, you can express yourself freely, but if no one's listening, it's a <laughs> yes. tree falling in the forest. Uh, <clears throat> can you describe for us, for people who don't know much about China, haven't been there, what are the essential differences between the media in this country and in China? Uh, in China, I think basically there is no freedom of media. Basically, really, there is, for instance, if something happened, uh, important events, uh, the central government, they will issue, issue a, a, a text. Basically, all the agencies, all the newspapers and TV stations will follow the same format. Yeah. So you can't go beyond that. Yes. And, but in this country, basically, uh, every agency, every paper has its own room to, to report the truth, I think. That's a huge difference. For instance, recently, there was a kind of border dispute between China and India, and the Chinese side basically backed down, but they reported as a huge victory. <laughs> the in Indian troops re retreat, retreated from uh, the occupied ground. But the truth is the Chinese government agreed to stop building the road. That was a huge, huge setback to the Chinese government's yes. plan. But this was unknown to the Chinese, not reported at all. So there are many newspapers, many news sources, but they're all basically telling the same story. Exactly the same. The propaganda department, they issued the order. You can't go beyond that. 
in this country, we hear so much, so many references to the media as though it were some sort of monolithic thing. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's, it's not. No, it's not. There are, that's why there are varied voices and diverse voices that make people, you know, we have a different perspectives, our own personal take on events. But in China, most of the people just the one voice. That's very, make people blind to realities. Hmm. We're still trying to figure out to what extent the Russians influenced public opinion in our election. Do you see the Chinese government influencing public opinion or reporting in this country? Yes, yes. And how? Oh, for instance, there are some uh, news agencies basically they give the feeling that they are just the branch of the Chinese government official, uh, official. Uh, Media, for instance, there's one called Doorway. It's a similar, similar like uh, People's Daily Overseas uh, edition. And also, I think even uh, American Chinese language media or newspapers, they have to be aware of the responses from the Chinese government. So that is also indirect censorship. A lot of things they can't just report blindly or openly. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're naive about how foreign governments are influencing our public opinion? I think to some extent, yes. I, I do believe the Russians and the Chinese, they try, they try hard. And not just the directly, for instance, Trump has family businesses in China. And so there, there are ways for the Chinese government basically to, to influence uh, officials and uh, important offices. That's, that's normal. Uh, even from the, you know, early, the Bush administration. I remember clearly the Chinese, once there was a dispute between China and the United States, a Chinese delegation landed in, uh, uh, in Washington, D.C. At the airport, they said, we are not talking to the Bush, Bush Jr., President Bush Jr. We, we are going to his father and ask his father to teach him a lesson. So, <laughs> wow. So really, they have, you know, in other words, they have ways of, uh, they, I, my feeling is that they speak different language. They, op, they, they communicate on different frequencies. Hmm. That is, we don't know about mm -hmm. those. <laughs> hmm. The plot of your novel, which is, uh, it's kind of remarkable, is that Dallin receives an assignment to expose the truth about a romance novel from China. Yes. It's, a, it's about the, it's about 9-11. Yes. It, it sounds like a kind of 50 shades of 9-11. <laughs> uh, and uh, for some reason, the Chinese government takes an interest in, in promoting this romance novel, and the Bush people also promote it. And that was reported. <laughs> I yeah. Yes. It has a lot of different people yeah. promoting this novel, yes. but it's just a novel. Yeah. Uh, but Danlin becomes obsessed with exposing it as a work of propaganda. Yeah. Uh, there are lucrative Hollywood contracts, et cetera. Why would the Communist Party take an interest in a romance novel? See, very, very often it's not really the whole government uh, is involved. Very often it's just one or two officials who had connections with the author or the publisher. Mm -hmm. So as a result, but they use public, you know, the, the power of their office to sponsor an event like that. In the, in the actual event, in fact, it's more serious than that. In fact, it was reported that the novel was accepted by, uh, was purchased by James Car Car Caraman, you know, the great director, yes. Canadian director, yes. uh, and, you know, for uh, millions of dollars. Uh, it's really, it's even more absurd, <laughs> more <laughs> than, absurd your than my book. <laughs> <laughs> and now, Danlin, uh, it comes out later, or I guess early on, that uh, this novel is written by his ex-wife. So he's <laughs> being asked to expose as propaganda a novel by his ex-wife. That's the kind of assignment that would never be made in a legitimate I know. U.S. newspaper. Personal, yes, <laughs> conflict of interest. Yes, uh, yes, it would be a clear conflict of interest in any newspaper I know of. Uh, why did you pursue that sort of a plot? Because I think I want him, he's, he's not just a flat, you know, uh, black and white characters. Yes. There's personal motiv motivation involved. I do believe personal motivations in, at a historical moment that very often change, change a lot of things. Yes, yes. <laughs> he, of course, is convinced that he can do this without any influence at all. He will be completely objective know, as he goes about exposing his ex-wife. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's he's, he's uh, totally convinced himself that I he know, will be. yes. Yeah. <laughs> but that does, uh, that does seem absurd to me. Uh, 
<laughs> <laughs> Which raises the issue we were laughing, and it is funny. I think you're a brilliant novelist, but I do not think you're a funny novelist. <laughs> But this book is really funny. I mean, it totally took me off guard that you were writing this really witty, funny story. What did it feel different to you to be writing what is often comedy? I only, you know, before this book, you know, there's a small novel called In the Pond, my earlier book. Okay. So the, this book, in terms of the style, they are, you know, comic. Okay. But um, really, I, I agree. You know, people, even my publisher, didn't know how to deal with yes, this. Yes. Yeah. Basically, this was not typical. No, <laughs> uh, it's not my book at all. And, and but I really I want to write a, a kind of a, a cynical, <laughs> a dark humorous that kind of a novel. Does it have any precedent in your life? Have you been writing comedy and not showing anybody? No. <laughs> this is before this. There was only one in only the pond. One. Yeah, in the pond. But that book, you know, there was not. There was no. Uh, you know, there was published by a very small press called Zolan Books uh, in Cambridge, in Massachusetts. Oh, but I know one, Zolan. They're gone yeah, now. Yeah, it was went out of business yeah. long ago, 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, so the book basically, it, most people might not know. I didn't it. know about yes. it. Yes, but it is the same in terms of the style. It's similar. Oh, funny. But this one is, but. Uh, uh, the bold rocker is told in the first person, so mm -hmm. that is the difference. And it has a kind of Kafka-esque comedy to it. That's increasingly absurd, bizarre yes. situations. Yeah, I, I, I do believe reality is more bizarre than that, fiction. That, yeah, that I really believe believe in that. I was yeah. talking to Jasmine Ward. She said she had to write a, a particular story as nonfiction because if she wrote it as fiction, no one would believe her. <laughs> uh, yes. Funny. Yeah. Exactly. Very often, there are details you shape them. Uh, you want to make them fictionalized to make them see the story better. People don't believe in right. that, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. reality, in, in real reality, it, they are even darker, more bizarre. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, like Joseph Conrad, you're writing in an adapted language. And when you accepted the National Book Award for waiting, you said, I also wish to thank America, a land of generosity and abundance, that they have accepted me as a citizen. Above all, I thank the English language which is embracive and vibrant and has provided me with a niche where I can do meaningful work. Can you explain to us what it's like to try and create art in another language? Oh, there was a lot of, lot of frustration. I think in the <laughs> beginning, uncertainty was a big part, still is a big part, uh, because I didn't know whether I could write and how far I could go. Uh, it's but the beauty of the language, the English language, is that it has within it a, a grand tradition uh, in which non-native speaking authors became essential writers, mm -hmm. such as uh, Conrad and Nabokov. So in other words, the road is there, it's already open. Right. So uh, really, um, is, there's nothing original. Uh, really, they all depended on, on when I have the courage the luck and the ability. So gradually I figure out, in fact, uncertainty. Uh, certainty is not a human condition. So we, I had to take uncertainty as a part of the process. Right. Uh, that's also a price for freedom, right? And we are responsible for ourselves, ourselves, body and the soul. <laughs> so yeah. that, in that sense, I could take uh, uncertainty as, as a a creative process. Eventually, I realized, in fact, this is good because if everything is clear and certain, yes. it might turn out to be a bad book. Yes, uh, I know really what you mean. Yes, <laughs> no, it has to be. There has to be book. tension in there. Yes, you need the kind of nervousness, the edge. <laughs> right. Well, what do you mean about English being an embraceive language? Not just that it embraces other words, I suppose. You mean something else? Yes, um, but I look at uh, you know, the people writing, a lot of people from different languages. And the, but English can accept all the language, all kinds of Englishes as a literary language. That's a great, great uh, you know, uh, phenomenon. Uh, really, for other authors, uh, for people from different backgrounds, different languages, this is a great, great mm -hmm. opportunity, great, great space. I think a great space where you can work. For instance, Chinese is a highly literary language. People speak all kinds of dialects. Yes. But when we come to the page, you, you have to write a very 
a, a language that is separated from natural speech. Oh. It's a literary language. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, that language is somehow already formed. It shapes the story. It shapes, right. yes. The dialects, many dialects, are not presented in the literary language discourse. There's no way to represent No, them. no. The, by contrast, in English, all kinds of English, as long as right. you write well, everything can be accepted as a literary language. Google Translate gives us the impression that translation is a matter of replacing one word with a word in another language. Yes. But that's not the case. No, 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 it's, <laughs> no, no, it's completely different. Because when you write a literary work, you have the, there's always a playfulness. You want to, the language to be uh, somehow slightly odd, uh, fresh. Uh, when the academic language defamiliarization, right? You make it unfamiliar to others. But in fact, in for people from another, people from different languages, the ultimate task is what can you bring to English? So that's for, for me, because I started as a poet, that was a question uh, uh, on my mind constantly. Without embarrassing you, what do you think you bring to the language? I basically, I try to really try to, to write a language that have a different resonance, that sounds foreign, but at the same time entirely natural. That's my vision. No, I think that's the vision you realize. In this I don't book, know, I don't no, know. You do. You do. Oh, thank you. I'm, that, no, but that's my, uh, you know, I try to imagine, because I, as the people from my situation, I didn't, uh, I had not met a, sing, a person who spoke English before I was 21. Job. So, and uh, there was no way for me to, to just write standard English right. because that would be flat, right. unoriginal in any way. So it's right. better for me to basically just to write, uh, 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 make it a strange, a little bit strange. Do you conceive of stories in Chinese or in English now? Uh, always in English. In English? In English, yeah. If you conceived of a, this story in Chinese, it would be a different story? Very different. As I said just now, that the, lang the language, the Chinese literal language, it has little to do with natural speech. It's created by all the Chinese to share, mm -hmm. no matter what dialect you speak. That's different, very different. So, but the English is really, it, it's remarkable. It is so close to natural speech. In that sense, it is very embracing. Everything can be included. Including Danlin's thoughts, yes. his urgency, his uh, naivete, uh -huh. all those things that you capture in both his thoughts and his spoken language, when he sounds so strident that it almost sounds like a parody of somebody believing in America. Yes, but you see, that's the situation. I should be uh, uh, more elaborate about this. That is, when the characters, when they communicate, especially when they speak Chinese, very often I, I would hear Chinese expressions. Yes. So I would adapt, try to not transcribe, but adapt, adjust, to make them more comprehensible to the English ear. So I do. The Chinese, uh, lang the language is behind, the, in the background of the creation. Because these characters yes, also they, speak Chinese. Yes, yes, exactly. So I wouldn't say this has nothing to do with Chinese. Right. Chinese is always in the background. It they make noise. <laughs> yes, and it influences the way they speak English. Yes, yes. 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 Yeah. I thought it was a fascinating novel in terms of its themes about journalism and the place of journalism in America. Uh, it's really uh, troubling. Oh, thank you. Made me yes. think in more complex ways about the privileges that we have and how they are so routinely abused. Uh, yes, a lot of things, you know, I didn't expect, but when it was published, a lot of things became transparent. For instance, for instance the Chinese government, in fact, in the early 2000s, I think they began to acquire media uh, facilities. I was troubled by it. I talked to some friends, and they didn't care. Uh, but gradually it got bigger. Not just newspapers and the TV stations, but you know, there are a lot of other things. Even companies uh, at Hollywood. <laughs> yes, what, you, what your novel explores and brings out is that what we think of as government control of the media is far too simplistic. It's not just that governments will censor stories. No. It's that they will obscure the truth yes. by flooding our lives with so many slightly different stories. Yes. 
That's the, I think that communist uh, propaganda, they don't, they don't report anything without some kind of facts. Yes. <laughs> uh, under it, usually they, but they shape the facts, they start the fact, very often there is some truth in it, but they stretch it and distort it, make it feel differently. And promoting so many different stories that after a while you just kind of check out, you know, oh, what, who, what can we believe? I know, know? yes, yeah. yes. Would, would you, uh, it's such an important subject for this town, I'm, I'm just so grateful you wrote this book. Oh, thank would you, you take some questions from the sure, audience? I'll be, yeah, I'll be better happy. Yeah. There's uh, two microphones, one here and one here. Please come to the mic, wave your hands a bit, it's hard for us to see you, the lights are so bright. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks very much. It's very Thank interesting you. to hear your remarks. Uh, my question is about uh, Nanjing Requiem. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who don't know, I urge them to buy it and read it, the story of the Nanjing Massacre. Mm -hmm. I read in the New York Times review of that that Jilin University, at the heart of that, mm -hmm. was a symbol of civilization. And when I read the novel, I didn't see it in an allegorical way. I just thought it was a very uh, compelling story. And I wonder, mm -hmm. as you were writing it, whether you were thinking allegorically or whether you were just telling the events as they unfolded in Nanjing. Thank you. Uh, hi, it's, thank you. It, it's kind of, a, the, the book is really it's very hard because there were so many authors who tried, not only Chinese, in fact, authors in English tried to really write about that uh, uh, horrendous uh, uh, historical event. For me, I, I think I made it uh, allegorical, but it's not, that it was not my purpose. There was a there was a, a narrative about missionaries in China. Always, these people were described as kind of semi spies and mm -hmm. people who really uh, worked for imperialism. To some extent, that was true. But on the other hand, there's another kind of story that it was not reported. The Chinese didn't know that they did also did a lot of good things. For instance, in China every hospital would have a red cross. That is from the Catholic Church. People would know where you look for medical service. In this country, we don't have that. But in China, it's always there, always there. That's, you know, that's a good influence, good mission, uh, missionary work. And just in, the same, in the same situation, I want to really write about the, basically the group of American missionaries, how they were involved in this tragedy. I think that it was an important moment in history. And uh, because this is Nanjing massacre, not only, you know, some event happened uh, between China and, and Japan, uh, it involved people from other countries. Uh, it, it was an inter international event. Toward the end of the book, it, was, it became transparent that the, you know, the Chinese didn't collect any material evidence. Only Americans uh, shot, Americans and Germans shot the photographs, even footage of the atrocities. But for me personally, basically it was a huge challenge. I really, I made so many missteps in the beginning. I told everything in third person, but after 30, 32 drafts, I couldn't continue anymore. I have to scratch the whole thing, uh, scrap the whole thing and restart uh, and uh, create a character who is a nar narrator uh, as assistant to Mini. And, uh, but for me, that personally, as an artist, that book was important because afterward I felt I could write uh, any novel, no matter how difficult I could. I could uh, try to manage to, to confront it. So before that, I. I didn't have that kind of confidence. So for me, it's very personal. It's like a hurdle. I had to cross it. I'm sorry. Um, two of my favorite books of yours are The uh, Crazed and A Free Life. And to some degree, characters seem to be defined by the degree to which they resist change or adaptation or the degree to which they embrace or adapt uh, to change in their lives. But there seems to be sort of a sadness of those characters who adapt mm -hmm. in terms of dreams that die or, yes. or things they leave behind that they can never take with them. I, I would like to ask you, you know, do you see something redemptive in that adaptation? You know, is there, do they become more focused? And how does that relate to your, your own experience? 
Uh, I'm glad, thank you so much. Those books are very close to my heart. And, and in fact, the quiz was my first novel, but I didn't have the skill to, to finish it. So it came out uh, after I had published two, <laughs> six books. And I think there is a redemptive uh, uh, kind of aspect of their experience. I think as, toward the end, they all become, somehow they become, the characters become independent. They want to, to go their own way, whether they perish or survive, but they want the freedom uh, to seek their own existence. Uh, in that way, my personal experience uh, does correspond to that. Thank you. Uh, I do have a question that may challenge uh, your earlier comment uh, mm -hmm. about the uh, modern Chinese language. Uh, mm -hmm. You said it was a, uh, it is standardized and uh, some kind of uh, uh, stiff, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, I know this is somehow true in uh, public realm. For example, yes. Chinese m media when they yes. are writing is really some standard language. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, from my own knowledge of uh, uh, Chinese literature in Chinese mm -hmm. in the past three decades. Mm -hmm. I see some really good examples of dialect writing. Yeah. For example, uh, Chen Zhongshi, uh, Bai Luyuan, and uh, newer, uh, uh, newer experiments by uh, uh, a novelist from Shanghai, like Fan Hua. Uh, I just mm -hmm. want to ask uh, if you are informed of this development, and if yes, how uh, would you make sense of it? Thank you. Uh, okay, that's a good question. I noticed that, especially Fan Hua, I think that's a, a very exper experimental novel, try to incorporate Shanghai dialect into the uh, standard Mandarin. And, but again, it's not a pure Shanghai uh, dialect, uh, because, th but people can feel this is different. That is a, a, a great uh, experiment. I think that's why uh, I, I different, on different occasions I said that it's a political gesture because the book challenges the, the political linguistic order. And uh, as for Chen Zhongshi, that's another you know, a great novelist who died uh, last year uh, or two years ago. I think his book is not uh, based, uh, I mean, the, di the language is not uh, uh, exactly based on the dialect, the regional dialect. I heard him, him speak and uh, see Jia, Jia Pinghua, there, in fact, the way they speak the language is very hard to understand, uh, to be understood by me. Even. Mm. But the, the on page, absolutely transparent, and the style is very clear. Um, I think in Chinese literature, there has always been a, a kind of a tradition. People from the South uh, suffer from the fact that their dialects are not presented in the uh, official standard of Mandarin whereas people from the north, they have the advantage. That's why a lot of people from Beijing and uh, from the north, very often they write, they write more naturally because the official language uh, is close to their natural speech. So there is a huge difference. This, I think, is a, in fact uh, reflect with historical facts. You see, the Chinese, when the first emperor, when he came to power, he basically violently he killed all the scripts. At the time, there were all kinds of uh, worm script, uh, bird script, all kinds, but he killed them all. So oh, there's only one written word. So as a result, in Chinese history, political history and cultural history, there is a term called uh, ratification of word, the word. That means the word must be precise. Mm -hmm. And that is a part of uh, the ruling uh, um, machine. You cannot uh, violate, uh, change the shape of words. So I think that is, that is uh, uh, but uh, the two, two books you mentioned, uh, really, th I think they, especially Fan Hua, I think it's a great uh, experiment. Uh, I think more authors should uh, do that. Uh, in other words, people began to try to make the dialect present in the literary discourse. But this is just the beginning. When you say the word can't be shaped or changed, mm -hmm. do you mean it's physical representation on the page or do you mean something about its meaning? Both, 
especially the, even the physical presentation. And how does that affect you as a poet, where the shades of meaning and the shaping of words seems to be the whole industry of poetry? I, I know, that's why, in fact, that's why the, the, the literary discourse has to be, in fact, has been some official. Uh, it, it might be less now, but conventionally, it's very important, especially when you write a report to, to the palace, to the court. I think there was one case, the guy dropped a, a dot. He, he thought he would be beheaded. Uh, the, he was ter terrified. Uh, there are moments like that. You are not supposed to, to change the shape of the, of the word. Do you run up against, well, you, don't write in, you don't write poetry in Chinese, I suppose. I, I, I do, okay, I do. In fact, uh, uh, recent, in recent years, my wife was sick, so for a long time, I couldn't get into a, a, a start a novel. Mm -hmm. So I began to write a poetry. Originally, I thought that I wrote them in Chinese, but I thought they, they would be just the drafts. Mm -hmm. So the ultimate goal would be write good poetry in English. But I, once I started, I felt you know, Chinese it was still my, uh, my first language, my mother tongue. So these should be poems in Chinese. So I began to publish. I published a lot, in fact, late in recent years. I published two books of poetry in Chinese. But you then I rewrote them. Some in English? Them in English. You do your own translations? Not a translation, I just rewrote them. What because, do you mean? Why is that different to you? A lot of poems, a lot of poems, you can't just trans translate them. For, for instance, I gave you two lines. And you go, uh, in Chinese, it would be something like, uh, uh, this is like, I landed in a place my ancestors never heard of. Uh, in, I need to develop another kind of fortitude. But it's, the last line is not that good, <laughs> <laughs> because that is flat. But in Chinese, it's very neat, because there is a rhyme there. But in English, I, I, I rewrite the last line. I said, I need to grow a new backbone, a, a, a new image. So this is a case I had to rewrite them, not, not just the, uh, translate them. That's so, fascinating. So I re rewrote the, uh, some of the poems. So there was a book of poems forthcoming from a Copper Canyon Press. So I was, it's a convoluted process. But uh, I'm very fortunate somehow I managed to, <laughs> to get them published. Yes, <laughs> oh, that's fascinating. Yes, sir. Um, no, I think you kind of answered my question. Um, a few years ago, you uh, translated one of your work, uh, The Good Fall, um, yes. into Chinese by mm -hmm. yourself. Um, I just want to ask, how does it feel? I mean, all, after all these decades writing English, um, how does it feel for you to write in Chinese again? Do you have any plans to write a original novel in Chinese again? And uh, what makes you to uh, translate that uh, uh, book into Chinese in the first place? Okay, let me answer your question backward. <laughs> when, um, when I, you know, you have a collection of short stories to be translated, uh, you should keep the stories, the copyrights, the translation rights in your, in your own hands because it will be too complicated if another person translated your stories because every time a magazine or anthology want to uh, uh, reprint a piece, you have to go to the translator. Oh. And so for practical reasons, it's always better to do the short fiction by yourself. Now also, uh, short stories, there were less words. So <laughs> be, uh, that doesn't pay much. Uh, so it's better for you to, be, to do the work more careful, the, you know, more laborious the process. But as for the writing, uh, I felt, you know, uh, I really, I enjoyed that, the pro writing process. Suddenly I felt I, I was so at home uh, with the language. But to be honest, I didn't spend enough time, perhaps. Maybe I think 5% of the labor of the English compared mm -hmm. with the English, mm -hmm. uh, and the English text. But I honestly, there was a sense of a loss. I do believe that I if I, both in Chinese, I would have become a different kind of a writer, perhaps more like a poet. But I didn't spend, uh, even in poetry, I didn't invest enough energy in my personal uh, uh, existence in the language. So I couldn't say 
uh, much about that. But at least my t recent two books of poetry in Chinese that show that I really I could have become a, a, a meaningful writer in Chinese. But I, again, we have to you know uh, accept what the world has made of us. Oh, <laughs> fascinating concept. Yes. Um, so in my last year of college, I took a class called The American Novel with Philip Fisher. Mm -hmm. and, um, the last book that we read in the class, the kind of the culmination of the class, was your book Waiting, which was striking because it wasn't even set in America. Mm -hmm. um, the other uh, non-English speaking or sure. original English native uh, author that we read was Nabokov. Um, and uh, I guess I had my own kind of reactions and hypotheses mm -hmm. in thinking about why this book fit in this class. Mm -hmm. um, I was reminded of when my father told me many years ago that he believes that um, China will eventually become a democracy and um, made me, led me to wonder about how many generations of mm -hmm. people and authors would have to wait until that is ever realized. Um, I wondered maybe it was because of kind of the universi universality of um, waiting as a kind of a state of being, but I wondered, I guess you're the most natural person to ask and to hypothesize about why waiting is really an American novel. Um, I knew Fish, Fisher was my teacher too, at, <laughs> but at the time he was at the Brandeis, but then he went to Harvard. And I heard that uh, the book was taught as American, uh, American novel. In fact, there were many courses, in fact, uh, a colleague of mine also taught that novel in uh, his American fiction class. I think the universality is a big part of it. Also, uh, it, the language is a combination of uh, uh, American idiom, the American idiom, and also some Chinese accent in that novel. I think also the perception of the world, that that's important. Without my American existence, the immigrant experience, I couldn't have possibly written a book like that. So the other was the creation. The, uh, uh, it's also part of the American experience. But also it was published in America. <laughs> that's important. <laughs> that's why it's an American that's, book. Yes, yeah. and uh, nobody, in fact, in the beginning, people say this book, no, no Chinese publisher would take such a book. Hmm. They thought it was too plain, and the language was basically the book, the experience is so common. Um, but I, in other words, in terms of sensibility is American in many ways. I knew what uh, was essential to human experience. So I didn't go uh, turn to any flashy novel uh, experience, but I tried to stay with facts. Uh, in other words, my American experience uh, sharpened my eyes for the meaningful details. So there are many ways to justify uh, the choice of reading as an American novel. But also, eventually, I have become an American author, I think. Yes, we, th we think so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm just curious about your sort of foundational American experience, which were those first years at, in university as a young man at mm -hmm. Brandeis. Um, what, how did that appear to you, and what did you take advantage of in those first few years when you were making your decisions about becoming part of our American life? You know, when I came I, as a, to do graduate work, I had a wonderful job waiting for me in China, in the university, uh, as a researcher, a translator, and also professor uh, for American literature. Um, but, so I didn't plan to immigrate. Uh, I worked very hard. But I was separated from my family because my, my wife and the son were not allowed to come with me. So it was painful in that sense. I had to work very hard to, to make enough money for, uh, so the, the bank, the, in, in order to get the visa, you have to have like $3,000 in your saving account. Uh, so I, I really, work, but I did all kinds of work, at that jobs, I think that helped me a lot, custodian, and nighttime watchman and uh, bus boy. I did all kinds of work. I, I, I think that's very important. I started from scratch, mm. making me feel that, you know, uh, how as a person you bring bread to table, how that works, the process, how that works. That's important for me. So, uh, 
that is really down to earth uh, 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 process. I think what is the most important moment in my in my first year, in fact, uh, I people knew my fellow graduate students all knew that I I was married, but I had no family with me. Mm. So my one Indian student, Sangeeta, uh, who lived a floor uh, under uh, my apartment, below my apartment, at a party she asked me, why, did you, uh, why didn't you bring your family with, me, with you? I said, the government does not allow. And he said, why don't you, she said, why don't you sue your government? <laughs> Uh, for her part, it was a careless, uh, all casual uh, question. I didn't know. I, I didn't know how to put my head around the question. But it stayed with me all the time for many, many years. Because essentially, that is, in fact, a question point to the heart of the democracy, which is, uh, in theory, uh, in the eyes of the law, uh, the constitution, the individual, and the, the country are equal. But for also, in this country, we do have that kind of legal system to guarantee the individual civil rights, at least in theory. So an individual can sue a government. But for in China, China's constitution is fabulous, but it's just a piece of paper. Nobody take it seriously. You can't sue your government. Uh, so I think that was a very, very important moment. Uh, really shaped my understanding and perception of Amer American society. Eventually, in fact, at the beginning of this year, J uh, Judge James Robert, uh, he overturned uh, President Trump's uh, ban on the uh, seven uh, Muslim majority countries the, uh, from coming to the United States, right? Just a regular judge right. can overturn that because it doesn't come part with the, uh, our constitution. So in other words, a simple question that really uh, resonates, uh, stay with me. But basically, it manifests, uh, points to many, many meaningful aspects of American life and the culture. Mm. It's just such a pleasure to talk to you. I'm well, thank so you. glad you thank were here today. You. Thank, uh, you thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.